Hello and welcome to this installment of the University of New Mexico Biodiversity Webinar Series. I'm Senator Tom Udall and I'm pleased to be the honorary co-host of this series. There are few things more important to our nation than protecting the land that we love and the diversity of the species it sustains for future generations. Thanks to Dr. Banerjee and my friends at UNM for offering this public webinar. And thanks to all of you watching for staying engaged. The challenges we face can feel daunting sometimes, but together we can make a difference. Thank you. Hello, University of New Mexico. I'm Congresswoman Deb Holland. I would have loved to have seen you all in person, but we're all doing our part to reduce the spread of COVID-19. The Species in Peril Project here at UNM has been working hard to address the biodiversity crisis through grassroots initiatives and provide a local outlet for New Mexicans to discuss this issue that we all care so deeply about. Climate change is the challenge of our lifetime. If we're going to address climate change, we need to preserve our natural spaces. As a young girl, I learned how everything was connected with my grandfather in the cornfields. During the summers, I would go with him to irrigate the field and learn just how precious water is to all life. He, like the generations before him, understood the need to keep balance, not waste and respect the earth. Our efforts to protect and promote biodiversity within the natural world is critical to preserving the planet for future generations. I introduced the 30 by 30 resolution to save nature, Climate Stewardship Act with Senator Udall during this Congress. It's an important tool for protecting biodiversity. The resolution will establish a national goal of conserving at least 30% of our land and 30% of our oceans within the United States by 2030. I want to thank all of you for taking the time and the energy to work on this important issue. You are the leaders of a movement to ensure we have a planet for the future. Keep up the good work and be fierce. Thanks to Congresswoman Deb Holland and Senator Tom Udall for your welcome messages. Um, it was great to hear today the news that um, just yesterday, the Senate passed a resolution to recognize November as National Native American Heritage Month. Um, so we're celebrating with you about that. I'm speaking to you today from the ancestral territory of the Tiwa people, whose descendants today include the Pueblos of Sandia and Isleta. And thank you to all of us who, are, all of you who are joining us this evening for this third out of four in the biodiversity webinar series. The series is organized by the Peril Project at the University of New Mexico um, in partnership with the Office of U.S. Senator Tom Udall, Office of Congresswoman Deb Holland, New Mexico Biopark Society, the Southwest Environmental Center, and the Indigenous Design and Planning Institute here at the UNM School of Architecture and Planning. And we're so grateful to Senator Tom Udall for serving as honorary co-host of this webinar. My name is Elspeth Irilu. I'm a visiting assistant professor of indigenous planning and a doctoral candidate in American studies at the University of New Mexico. And I study indigenous sovereignty, surveillance, and visual culture. I'm happy to serve as the moderator for tonight's conversation, but I'm especially thrilled to welcome tonight's three distinguished indigenous panelists. Conservationist Norma Cassie from Yukon, Canada, is a Goldman Prize winning conservationist and longtime defender of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Professor Robin Wall Kimmerer is a scientist and celebrated author of Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants. And she's also the director of the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment at SUNY Syracuse. And President Fawn Sharp is president of the Quinault Nation and president of the National Congress of American Indians. The title of today's webinar is Indigenous Kinship and Multi-Species Justice. And this title points to the ways that many indigenous peoples around the world understand the more than human as relatives, making the biodiversity crisis an intimate issue for indigenous life. According to the United Nations, indigenous peoples make up 5% of the world's population and we protect 80% of the world's biodiversity. So it's clear that indigenous knowledge, practices, stories, values, and ideas must foreground and shape biodiversity action and public policy at all scales. So that's what we're here to discuss tonight. Um, following the conversation between panelists, we'll reserve the last half hour of our time together 
for the panelists to respond to questions from the audience. So we invite you to post your questions in the Q&A, um, which is at the bottom of your screen. And because the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge is immediately threatened by the Trump administration's rush to sell oil leases and conduct seism seismic surveys in the coastal plain of the Arctic Refuge, I'm so grateful to all three of you for being here with us this evening. And I wanted to start our converse conversation um, by just hearing a little bit about your journey in your work um, in your life and um, how your journey and your experiences led to your interest in environmental action. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for giving me the honor to be here with you all. Um, my name is uh, Norma. My Buchin name is Guahachakti, one who gives away their last cup of tea. Shikin Jigjit Gweet Salkinihe, Guahachakti Ihli, Jat Nokahdihti, and Jit Klaju Guavat Gutsit Haik Nithan. But Zaichan at Gehia, I ended Chan at Heitnithan. To share some of my language and say thank you so much for this opportunity. We are going to be talking about our homelands, our biodiversity, our caribou, and things like that. And for that, I give thanks to to for to Creator and Mother Earth for allowing me to sit here with you all. And I just want to say that um, I was. Uh, raised in Old Crow Flats in North America's second biggest wetlands and uh, for, as a child born into that area. And um, it was the, it's a absolutely incredibly beautiful place with birds from all over the world that come there to have their young ones and, um, and a caribou herd that's right now the largest migrating caribou herd left on the planet. And it's at probably around 270,000 strong right now. And they are now wandering through our communities um, and go, heading down towards the tree line. And, um, and we, it's just an incredible place where I was raised. I was taught to be very close to the land and that, that nothing, that I was not above any species of plant or insects or anything like that, that it, it, it was um, that, and my job was to um, learn a lot of this. And later on in life, I became involved in, in areas in politics and fighting for our caribou in 1998. The Guchin people um, asked me to, uh, the Guchin elders asked us to start speaking out and chose eight of us to start that campaign. And that started in 1987, 88. And uh, our people have been fighting to protect the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge for a long, long time. It's a beautiful place up there in Northeastern Alaska where all polar bears, den, um, all the birds from all over the world have their, they breed, they molt, they, they live there in that area during the summer seasons and many animals give birth and we call it the place where life begins. So I'll, I'll share that part with you and that's, um, that all those were captured in that little video as well. Thanks. And um, if you also want to share a little bit about your more recent work, that would be great as well. Okay, I'm, uh, I work with uh, an Indigenous leadership initiative um, that um, uh, what we are doing is campaigning uh, across Canada for several years now to increase um, indigenous protected areas, as well as land guardians within these areas uh, to assist Canada to meet their target of 17% of, uh, by 2020, I believe it is. And uh, so indigenous protected areas are being created. And right now I'm also co-director of a research network, the Canadian Mountain Network. And um, uh, what we have what I, I and many others who worked on this application to the National Center of Excellence for the first time in history, an application was accepted where indigenous knowledge was is going to be led. Indigenous research will be led by indigenous peoples in this country. And uh, so we're very proud of that. We'll be braiding sweet grass. We'll be braiding two knowledges together. And, uh, and, and uh, myself and Dr. Murray Humphreys are the co-directors of the Canadian Mountain Network. 
And that's what I'm doing presently. And also we're all Escuchin people in the battles to preserve the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge for years now. And we're gonna continue, we will never let this happen. So, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I think that there's a real connection between your work right now and Robin, your work. Um, so Robin, I'm wondering if we could hear from you about um, your journey and um, what you do today and sort of that connection. Yes, I'm seeing all kinds of connections and I'm, I too am really honored to be in all of your company. I'm already learning a lot and, and this, this is a great conversation already. Um, in our Potawatomi language, I will introduce myself to say bonjour, Jayak, Shabadowski Gish Kokwena Deshnakos, Bodwe Wadmikwenda, Megazedo Dem, Minwamakodo Dem, Syracuse, New York, Nadoch Bia, Shishibanyak Nebendagwes, and Mikwech Kinegeko, Gomijong. And in our beautiful Potawatomi language, of which I am just a student, um, told you that my Potawatomi name is Light Shining Through Sky Woman. I'm a member of the Bear Clan, also of the Eagles, and um, I'm enrolled in the Citizen Potawatomi Nation of Oklahoma, but I live here in the heart of Maple Nation, as I like to think of this piece of Turtle Island, um, in the uh, ancestral territories and contemporary territories of the Onondaga Nation at the, in the head, the sort of the central fire of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And um, I want to also give honor to the place where, where I stand, this little piece of Shkakmikwe of Mother Earth. Um, and I call it Mother uh, Maple Nation because the sugar maples and those beautiful hardwood forests are really our, our leading citizens. And um, we're a, a, a landscape of, of great richness in water and wildlife and, and, and plant beings. And um, right now here at the very end of, of, of fall, the, the last of the geese are, are, are flying south. It's about to get real quiet here. <laughs> Um, my work, um, I, I started out, um, really I was born a botanist is the truth of the matter. I, you know, I grew up, um, out in the country on the land and I can't remember a time when the plants weren't tugging up my sleeve saying, look at me, look at me. Um, and so they have always been my teachers and in a way my elders. And so there was no question when I went off to college that I would study botany um, because that's what I was meant to do. But um, my first day of college was very like, I, in a sense, my grandfather's first day because he, as a child, was taken from our reservation and brought back east to the uh, Carlisle boarding school where his way of knowing, as we know, was, was violently erased. And growing up, I always felt that, you know, like all the things that I wanted to know had been taken away. And so I'm really happy to say that that story has my grandfather's experience is always on my shoulder and that the work that I do at the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment is, is meant to create a place where traditional knowledge, indigenous environmental philosophy becomes the scaffolding for using some of the conservation and environmental science tools that we have available. Um, and it's meant to be a place where erasure of knowledge doesn't happen, where it's an invitation to both native students and allied students to bring indigenous knowledge into um, the, the, our thinking about caring, caring for, for Mother Earth. So I work, you know, we do a lot of research, education, outreach work. Um, so I view our, 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 our work is so allied um, in that what I hope is that when we're training this next generation of conservation biologists, they don't graduate without knowing about treaty rights. They don't graduate without knowing about the ways that traditional knowledge can enhance our ways of caring for the earth, guide it. Um, so th that really is, is my work both as a, as a, a teacher, as a scientist, and, and as a writer as well. 
I should also add, you know, how could I not say that I'm also a mom and an Oakmas. Um, so my environmental work um, is absolutely informed by looking at my grandchildren and, and being dedicated to leaving them a world um, here in Maple Nation and around the world um, that will bring them joy and gratitude as well. Thanks so much, Robin. Um, and Fawn, I think like I'm, I'm really enjoying the things that the threads that are coming up because I think that there's things here about like policy that are coming up. Um, so I'm wondering if you could share your journey and about your work and um, connections that you're seeing there. Yes, absolutely. Uh, good evening. My name is, is Fawn Sharp and I serve as president uh, of the Cornell Indian Nation and president of the National Congress of American Indians. I'm only the ninth president at Cornell since the turn of the last century, uh, the second woman president, and I'm the 23rd president of the Congress. And my, my journey began, I think, the day I was born, uh, uh, because I, I was born two months before President Nixon stood before Congress to formally repudiate termination as federal policy. So I often say I was born in the 59th second of the 11th hour of termination and the creator called me the, to this uh, generation, this time and place during a new and emerging era of self-determination and self-governance. And it's been my lifelong mission uh, to, to uh, serve and, and to completely surrender my life uh, mentally, physically, spiritually to serve um, the creator's purpose and calling for my path. And so that's the, the beginning of, of uh, the context of where I, I come from. I, uh, in my early childhood, I was uh, part of a, a fishing family. My grandparents fished for a living on the mighty Quinault River. We harvest a very unique species of sockeye salmon called blueback salmon in the Quinault, and I would get up early in the morning with my grandparents, and we'd make the early morning trip up the Quinault River. Along the way, I heard many stories. I heard a, a, a lot of our uh, traditional knowledge, uh, my grandparents' wisdom, and I knew that there were some at that time that were aggressively seeking to terminate our treaties, that our treaties were at, we, we were literally at war defending our treaties. Um, mentors of mine, like Billy Frank Jr., had been jailed over 50 times they were beat on the river uh, we'd go into town our tires would get slashed so we were literally involved in treaty wars and, and as a young child that's what molded and shaped my appreciation for the value of, of that treaty and what it meant to protect not only our livelihood and, and the salmon resource that my grandparents relied on for a living but that was central to our identity so that was deeply embedded within me as a young child. And at eight years old, I knew what treaty abrogation meant. At eight years old, I knew there were others that were aggressively mounting campaigns to terminate tribal nations. And out of that era, uh, I, I was influenced to seek uh, a, a legal profession to, to pursue law. And, and I knew at a young age, that was something I wanted to do. At the time, no one in my family had gone to college. It seemed like a a very lofty aspiration that I want to grow up and become an attorney, a warrior lawyer of, of sorts and defend our treaties. And so I, I was determined as a, a child that that's a direction I felt very strongly. That was my calling. And so I graduated from high school when I was 15. I was, I was fairly young when I left the reservation and, and I had all kinds of challenges leaving at that age. I spent 10 years from the time I was 15 to 25 uh, pursuing higher education. I, I um, uh, received a, an associate's degree, um, a bachelor's degree in criminal justice, ultimately my law, my law degree, and then I studied international human rights law overseas. I came back to Quinault after moving 17 times back to my home community, the, the, the tribe that I grew up in, and I was uh, appointed as a, a tribal court judge at Quinault, and by the state of Washington, I was a tax appeals judge and I was at that point in my career was prepared to commit completely to a, a, a life in, in the practice of law. My goal was someday I might defend a, a treaty lawsuit in the US Supreme Court. I had no political aspirations at that time. And our president had announced her retirement 
and some elders talked to me about running for office. And I remember some of those early conversations. I, I told them, are you crazy? I, I've been trained to seek truth, justice, fairness, politics, uh, tribal politics. It just didn't uh, reconcile with my personal concept. But an elder pulled me aside. He said, look, Fun, you're not running to be a politician. You're running to be a leader. And a leader brings those virtues to office. And so that is the moment in which I transitioned from uh, being a, a legal practitioner to uh, entering a life of politics. Uh, I got elected in 2006 and had never holding political office. Uh, I had to chair a meeting with three constitutional amendments. I had to chair my first council meeting that Monday and testify before Congress on, on Wednesday, all within a few days of being elected. And so I recall vividly sitting down thinking, okay, uh, now what do I do? And I knew we managed a, a large land base at Quinault, 31 miles of international border, uh, 220,000 acres. And so I literally Googled uh, best practices, forest management, uh, revenue streams. And uh, I learned about this thing called uh, carbon sequestration. I learned about this thing called climate change. I learned about uh, risks to our, our salmon. And that year I convened a meeting of our citizens to identify priorities. It was my goal to lead a nation by upholding the vision of our community and being a servant leader. And quickly out of those community uh, meetings I convened that first year in office, our elders identified the need to protect our prized sockeye salmon was at risk. The need to protect our landscape was at risk. And all of these things started uh, coming together to paint a very clear picture to a newly elected tribal leader that I was gonna need to figure out how to preserve and protect that sacred lands upon which our ancestors were gifted when time began and that something was completely out of balance. And, and so um, in that first year, I, I had to declare a national state of emergency. We had a, a severe winter storm that wiped out um, our, our water supply, wiped out our power uh, there was a dead zone of two miles of marine habitat that was just littering two miles of our borders. And I had a briefing with our scientists and I began to learn about things like ocean acidification. I learned about our melting glaciers. I learned about sea level rise. I learned about all of these challenges of climate impacts. And I, I, I came to discover that Quinault uh, was at the front lines of the impacts of climate change. And I, I took a helicopter flight over the Anderson Glacier and my heart just sank as we came over the ridge. I thought I was gonna see a glacier. It completely had disappeared. It was gone. There was just a mud puddle of murky water and, and there was not a glacier. And to, to know that I once as a child fished on those rivers with my grandparents, to know in the 50s and 60s, we had millions of sockeye salmon that year, we only had 3,000 return to see the glacier that feeds the mighty Quinault completely disappearing. That moment in that year is what just fueled my passion and my interest in uh, seeking to protect uh, our community uh, through climate policy and uh, climate negotiations. And, and I remember early in those years, back um, during the Bush years of 2006 and seven. I would raise the issue of climate change and it was very difficult to engage in any meaningful conversation because I would talk about climate change, uh, someone would change the subject and then we would, would move on. But uh, where I am now and going forward, I, I just wanna say this very briefly that I believe that every bit of what we are dealing with in this generation, whether it's a global pandemic, whether it's climate change, we know these are mere symptoms of a much deeper imbalance that didn't begin in 2020, it didn't begin a lifetime ago, it began centuries ago. And it, uh, indigenous peoples, we've known that this day of reckoning is coming. We've been prepared to be part of that solution. And so I firmly believe that at this moment and, and at this time, uh, we are ready for a national conversation and it's events like this where we can bring traditional ecological knowledge, our, our wisdom, our, because the path forward is restoring balance. It, 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 it's truth and reconciliation to those foundational principles, because quite frankly, we are in a country that's unhinged from those basic principles, and no one is immune, everyone is impacted, we all have to come together with an inclusive, strategic, and aggressive uh, plan to restore balance to our community. If we are to survive as humans, if we are to be resilient in the face of global pandemics, and so 
uh, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Thanks, Vaughn. Yeah, I think that um, you got right to the heart of sort of the topic of the conversation is thinking about um, the biodiversity crisis, how do we address it, and um, what does an Indigenous-led approach to that look like? I think all of you have started to, um, to point out examples of how Indigenous people have been doing that for a long time. Um, so I guess maybe we could jump to thinking about like how do Indigenous ways of, of being, like our values, practices, and knowledges, um, how do those, how are those an alternative to or different from the values that brought us to the current biodiversity crisis that we're in now? Um, and Robin, I saw you nodding while Fawn was talking, so I'm going to call on you if you're, <laughs> if that's okay. These were um, nods of, of affirmation and cheering you <laughs> on. <laughs> I think that there's so much to say about that, um, but it, in response to that notion of cheering you on about restoration, you know, this restoring balance. And the work is, of course, to both restore land, but it is also to heal our relationship to land. This fundamental wound that you're talking about, this yes. This worldview that enables people to say, oh, well, we're living in the Anthropocene, that arrogant uh, human-centered way instead of the biocentric way of, of thinking about all of our relatives. You know, we, we live in a place where policy is written about natural resources that, that among all of our people would say the land is a natural resource you know it's our it's a gift it's a gift that and we you care for the land very differently when you frame it that that way so i think that that our orientation toward healing and the fact that we know that as people we can be medicine for the earth, you know, and that not only that we can be, but that we always have been, and that this is our responsibility, as opposed to that Western worldview that has this notion that 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 humans and, and nature are necessarily a bad mix. Well, they've demonstrated that it certainly can be that way. Um, if you come with this worldview of human exceptionalism, that it's all about you, if you think that, you know, you're at the top of some pyramid of, of, of worth and, um, and, and, and value and success as opposed to being like, I think of it as one member of the democracy of species. Um, I think it is that worldview of human exceptionalism that gives permission for an exploitive economy um, and the beautiful coherent kin-centric way of indigenous thinking is the medicine is the medicine um, for for that. And maybe later, what, I, I don't want to jump ahead here, Elspeth, um, but I would love to to eventually think about the way that we that we guide the tools of restoration with the worldview of reciprocity, um, because I think that that's where where healing lies and where the gifts of, 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 of land knowledge coupled with spirituality have particular potency. Norma, I think this maybe touches on some of the um, ideas you introduced in your intro. Um, yeah, so I wonder if you wanna to respond to this idea of um, indigenous values, practices and knowledges and how might they address the biodiversity crisis differently from how it's being addressed. So I just wanted to take it back a bit to my homelands again. Um, we live in the Arctic. I live way up there in the Arctic. And um, the beautiful um, lands that I spoke about earlier where I was raised, uh, with all the birds converging in our homelands in the springtime and uh, caribou migrating through our, our, all the lakes and all of that are, has changed drastically. Um, the lakes, the big lakes now have all are draining out and drying up. The permafrost is melting underneath uh, and, uh, and a lot of methane gas. And uh, right now the birds have come to, uh, not, too, not too many birds come that way like it used to black in the skies, like we say. Um, things have changed drastically. And then 
in the springtime, we have two rivers that go by my, that join up just before my community and come back. And when it melts in the springtime, um, ice, just thick ice and debris just pour down the rivers and uh, all these trees and things that have been taken off the sides of the banks because of the permafrost melting is going down these rivers and down into the Pacific Ocean. And then I think about our brothers and sisters in the Southern Pacific and how their islands are beginning to, um, um, you know, they're be beginning to have shorter and shorter shore shorelines and, uh, and that's how affecting them. And then, you know, I think about how, um, how much knowledge uh, that we have that my grandfather told me that these things were coming. He said to me that there's going to come a time when there's gonna be hardly any animals around here anymore. There's just gonna be a pair of loons out there and that you will know then the land has changed drastically and that it's going to be a future that we are gonna to have to contend to and try and survive through. He also told me about the diseases that were coming and, um, and how they had gone through that and that it will come as well. So that we were, we're here today and, um, and, and the, you know, our mother earth has been extremely exploited. I mean, holy smokes, the nature has brought us to a standstill. And um, it's, I always listen to our elders and Dave Cruchane from the Turtle Lodge in Canada teaches that we must go back to the root of the problem, which is, you know, our earth. Nature will bring us back to a standstill due to our loss of caring, connectivity, and spiritual ways. And we've been through this before, and the earth and our peoples have a strong memory, and we have survived, and we have to look at the original instructions that were given to us of love, the, the love that Mother Earth gave us and held us and nourished us and, uh, and the, this love from the land that we have to go back to. And um, um, so another thing that's um, changing with indigenous peoples across this country in Canada here is that um, our people are moving closer, I mean, working hard to, to get m more indigenous protected areas that are taken care of and guarded and stewarded by our people ourselves. We want to be able to, to um, do that because we have so many endangered species uh, and everything like everyone is experiencing around the world, we, we are experiencing here as well. The more indigenous protected areas that we have that's led by most of the land that's protected in Canada, 80% of it has been initiated by indigenous peoples in this country to protect. And within those lands, our elders are beginning to train, retrain uh, land guardians, young people, men and women to be, to go out there and be the eyes and ears and the boots on the ground and take care of those homelands. And as we go out to our lands, the animals begin to wake up and they see us. And it's, it's we shared those lands for thousands of years and we, we interact with those animals again and they begin, they begin to get nourished and come back. So I think our place as indigenous peoples is absolutely profound. And we've been here for since time immemorial. So we have a lot of knowledge that we can share. And uh, also, you know, we need to also look at research and the way it's done. Multi-billions of dollars have been uh, utilized to look for all the minerals, oil and gas and archeology span and everything like that. Billions have been spent in our homelands. And very little has been spent on uh, bringing our indigenous knowledge and research to the forefront. So I think it's time now, this is time now, past time that we need to do that and bring that knowledge for our future generations. Um, it's the young people in the future that you know we have to lay the ground for and, and bring forward our concerns and our education and our knowledge. And I think that, that um, this is where we're at now. And this is indigenous and non-indigenous youth working together for their future. I mean, all of you all over the world, you know, my heart goes out to you wherever you are because um, 
you know, the pandemic is there, it's everywhere. And I just hope that you are well right now and, and that, uh, you know, tonight we will together bring hope for the future that there are ways to heal Mother Earth and heal our lands and, um, and really embrace that love because we have just the one planet and, uh, right now and um, we need to really embrace her and look after what's left on her. And um, I think that's uh, where we need to go walking hand in hand together with all peoples of this planet walking together and moving in that direction. Um, and, uh, you know, trying really hard to face food insecurity uh, in, in our homelands. You know, we have to grow things wherever we can grow things and um, um, turn grass into vegetables, even on your balconies. And, and help each other out that way. And I think this pandemic has brought, um, brought the love back up from the land for, for each other. And I think we need to really embrace that uh, as a peoples and uh, move forward together hand in hand. Thanks, Norma. Um, I'm gonna add a little bit on to this topic and I'd like to ask Fawn if you'd be, um, if you could consider this and get us started on this thought. Um, but I'm curious, since we're talking about sort of the role of indigenous values, knowledge, and practices, um, I'd like to think about what does that mean for indigenous nations? Um, and so maybe adding on to this conversation, just another layer of um, what do you see as the role of indigenous nations in advancing multi-species justice and um, protecting biodiversity? And that could be on um, a variety of scales, you know, it could be with one indigenous nation, it could be on um, a national, federal level, or could an international level, even, you know, like United Nations or other international bodies. So Fawn, I wonder if you want to take that on. Uh, yes, uh, th that is an excellent question. And I would, I would start that uh, conversation by suggesting that the, the 574 uh, tribal nations of this country are uh, a, a generation that is um, the product of, of, of many generations from when time began. And uh, when you consider the fact that we may have ceded vast millions of acres of, of land across this country, we never relinquished our spiritual connection. And, and so the very foundation of these lands uh, are, are representations of generation after generation of songs, of prayers, of ceremonies, that is the land we are on sacred land that has been blessed and that heartbeat that you hear no matter which tribe you go to and you hear the songs and, and you hear that drum beat that's representative of, of our our spirit that you know has been here since time began it's eternal it's going to be here uh, long after our generation is gone so i think knowing that tribal nations bring not only multi-generations of, of trauma and conflict, we bring multi-generations of strength, of wisdom and of resilience. And so we are the people that represent that foundation of understanding that these lands are, are very sacred, they're hallowed lands and they were once um, balanced. And you know, there's this thought that upon European contact, we were, uh, we were primitive. But if you look at social scientists that talk about various levels of maturity, at the very base, you have selfish people, then you have independent people, and then you have interdependent people. Well, we are interdependent not only to relative, our, our relative humanity, we are interdependent relative to our creator, to all things living, uh, the very subject of this conversation. And so we were very mature. And if you take a society and a, and a people that stand on that rich knowledge, that rich wisdom and those rich values. That is something that we bring to the table that is, is very unique and that only tribal nations, only the indigenous peoples of this country can bring that to the table. So that's what really uh, uh, makes us unique and puts us in a unique position uh, of knowledge, of wisdom and, and quite frankly, moral authority. And I think the average citizen today is starting to understand through the experiences of a modern day uh, tribal nations that we really are on the, the sort of last line of defense, whether it's our treaties that are stopping uh, multinational um, projects, whether 
it's, it's our value system, whether it's what we bring to the table, because through our many experiences, we are able to demonstrate uh, resilience time and time again. And so that's a, another value that we bring to the table. And then I would add, there's a spiritual dimension to what we do. Uh, all, all tribal nations, there, there's a unique um, spiritual dimension. Uh, I personally uh, belong to our canoe society here at Quinault and I'll just really uh, a quick experience it, but demonstrates the strength of that. So uh, I was in a canoe just outside of Seattle. We, we travel two to three weeks. Uh, we're ocean going people and they're not canoes that are manufactured. These are canoes that are dug out canoes from large cedar trees when we uh, go out to the ocean and uh, within the Salish Sea. And there was a point in time where water started coming into the canoe and I was on the bow and I was a pacer and my paddle wasn't even hitting the water. And I started to get a little panicky because our support boat wasn't near. We paddled and paddled and it didn't seem like we were moving. The waves were getting choppier. We're getting larger. And in just a split second, I had a, a vision of our ancestors as they paddled. And our tribal journeys, it's a spiritual experience and, and your, your mind can't quite process it but it's the experience that you reflect on days after the journey ends. And my lesson from that day, I think prepared me for my leadership role as the president of the National Congress, and not only the president of the National Congress in, in 2020, but uh, the president of nations facing a global pandemic, facing all, all of these things. But that lesson was when you're in the midst of a storm, uh, you can look around in fear, doubt, and uncertainty, or you can envision that our ancestors have gone through that path. And when I flipped that switch mentally, I could feel the strength in my, my arm, my hands as I paddled. And instead of working against the storm and fear, doubt, and uncertainty, I recognize there's strength and power in that storm. And I started working with it. And, and those are the kind of lessons that when we're out on the waters, whether we're uh, coastal people or we're in ceremonies, there is a, a body of knowledge and wisdom that strengthens us, that makes us uh, resilient, that, that there's that foundation. And I often think that the reason we face genocide was because we are now uh, the voices and the advocates for all of the animals, all of the living creatures that are now facing environmental genocide. So we had to go through that experience so that, that we could share that passion, we could share that plight to be the advocates so I think all of those things are what make tribal nations uniquely positioned, what we bring to the table. We bring that, that connection um, to the lands, we bring our experiences and we bring the spiritual um, power of our, our being that is, is designed and, and we are born. It's not work, it's what we do to protect the natural world. It's what we're taught to advocate for the fish that can't get out of the water, to walk through the halls of Congress or in the courtroom it's simply what we do, it's who we are. And, and nothing can separate that from us. We, we are part of the land, we're part of that relationship. And that is truly what gives us that foundation to be the advocates. Thanks, Vaughn. Norma, you have done, uh, just partly because of your geography, um, a lot of your work has been sort of transnational with the US and Canada, and of course, traveling all over the world. Um, so I wonder, yeah, if you could pick up on this idea of um, the positioning of tribal nations to um, to advance multi-species justice, both within um, within tribal nations or internationally. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for that question. That's a good one. I'm, I, the first two words that come to mind immediately are recognize uh, what has the injustices that have been done like our people have always been indigenous peoples all over the world in Brazil, Nicaragua, Guatemala, Peru, Chile, Australia, uh, Canada, United States, like to name some. Uh, we have been in the front lines fighting for the preservation of Mother Earth so that we can avoid coming to this place in time at this point. And um, so, so I think there's been a lot of policies um, that have been created and I think one of the most one of the most important policies I think that's been ever meant so much to Indigenous peoples is the UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration on Indigenous Peoples, the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. 
this clause in there is really important that gives that will that calls for pre prior and informed consent which refers to the rights of our peoples indigenous peoples worldwide and we i think if we if we want to be at a very ethical and respectful place seeding from the very local of governance in our first nations governments to the local regional governments then to the national and international to the united nations and other world uh, forums such as IUCN, UNESCO, um, the United Nations climate change conferences, we need to be at that level bringing indigenous knowledge and our values and our, um, our ways of preserving biodiversity. We need to be up front and center. We need to be equals there, you know, not just little side and there as indigenous people is that like we, we we can't do that anymore we have we we are at a place where that our knowledge has to be at the forefront and at every level and so these organizations the united nations included that assisted us in create, creating UNDRIP is something that we we uh we need to endorse at every level in governance and be there um, sometimes you, you get calls to, like I visited these some of these places in the world and, and sat with indigenous peoples and heard our stories. It's over and over. And you know we're still being hurt and massacred for things that we do. It's still going on. That, that stuff has to stop. We need to be recognized as indigenous peoples because the, some of the songbirds that has been declared endangered and the animals that have been in declared endangered are, are some of them are still and frogs are still in our on our reservations across this country and some of the cleanest water in the world some of them are on our uh, on our in our areas because we fought for that except the people who are all surrounded by cities and overpowered by that you know i mean right now we don't even have enough clean drinking water for the world we don't have enough food to sustain the world. So we need to get it together at every level. And um, indigenous peoples can bring ways of knowledge to that forefront, I think. Like again, United Nations Climate Change Conference, we need to be up there right pushing negotiations, the acceptance of UNDRIP, the recognition, the IUCN, we need to be there, UNESCO as well. You know, We need to be at that level. And uh, so if we speak about policies, our First Nations governments are doing tremendously well in, in, in trying to lead this and move forward. And they, they are bringing um, the youth right along with them. Like our local governments are, are uh, here in the Yukon in particular, um, we're working closely with our youth. The Assembly of First Nations, for example, that's Canada's biggest indigenous organizations organization uh, representing over 600 um, indigenous peoples. Um, our regional chief here in the Yukon is leading the way in terms of educating our youth and trying to bring this braiding of knowledge and youth and non-indigenous youth together. The, you know, um, our youth really need that now. We absolutely need to stand beside them. And uh, we're gonna continue doing that at every level. However, you know, at, at some point the international community are going to have to recognize that we need to be up at the forefront. Thanks. We have a few minutes left in this first section of the webinar before we turn to um, questions from the people tuning in. Um, so I thought maybe as our final question we could uh, discuss what might an Indigenous-led biodiversity action plan look like. Um, and Robin maybe you could start us off and then um, and Norma and Fawn, you can chime in when you are moved. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to. And, and I'd like to connect the dots of, between the words of my sisters here um, about thinking about the ways in which when we think about a biodiversity conservation and restoration plan, one of the images that really shapes my thinking is and I'm thinking of the biodiversity scientists who are listening tonight. Um, we know when we look at the global map of biodiversity hotspots around the world, you know where they are. And if you map the homelands of indigenous peoples 
and the diversity of indigenous languages, they map almost one for one, right? As you've both been saying, it is in our homelands where biodiversity is, is uh, safeguarded. You've both brought up the notions of, of our spiritual tradition is underlying that pattern. Yes, yes, and yes. Our governance patterns, how we govern our relationships to one another and to the living world. Yes, all of those things. But I think also underpinning this biodiversity mapping and the ways in which indigenous peoples not only protect biodiversity, but generate biodiversity means there's one more thing that we need to bring to the table. And well, at least one more thing, but the one I want to, to really lift up is indigenous science. Um, because our people have always been scientists, right? And the ways in which we have tended the land from time immemorial, harvesting in such a way, not that the populations diminish, but we learn to harvest in such a way that the populations flourished after harvest. We learned to use, we learned our sophisticated indigenous science to apply fire, right? not to create homogeneous, uniform, catastrophic landscapes, but to create diversity. Um, all of our life ways were meant to create diversity for a couple of reasons, both that food security for our people relies on biodiversity. All flourishing is mutual. Our people wouldn't flourish if the salmon didn't flourish, if the bison didn't flourish, right? If the berries didn't flourish. And we used our science to do that. And Western colonial science and policy has, um, has really erased indigenous ways of land management. So my way of thinking about what does biodiversity conservation look like from an indigenous perspective is the application of indigenous science. Um, to listen again to our people um, informed by a sacred science um, that, that holds the spirituality, our spiritual responsibility and material responsibility for the water, for those frogs, for those geese, for our wild rice. And one of the other elements that, that I really think a lot about in, in a biodiversity um, framework comes also from our languages. That's the other thing that I wanted to put on the table when you asked about indigenous leadership in this way. Our languages are a source of so much knowledge about land care and about relationship to place. Again, we see that map of language and, and biodiversity. And one of the most powerful elements of our languages is its animacy. That in most of our languages, we cannot say it about the living world. That mountain is not an it, that mountain is a person. Um, that river is not an it, that river is our relative. Um, this land is not an it, it's our mother. And so this notion of the personhood, which is inherent in our language, is I think the philosophical basis for the rights of nature movement, based on the indigenous notion of the personhood of all beings. And we see from the Ponca nation in Oklahoma to the Klamath people, right, in, 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 in Oregon, to the Wanganui River, our Maori brothers and sisters are using this concept of personhood held in our language as a way to protect biodiversity by recognizing the sovereignty of, of other species. Um, and so those are uh, several elements that I would think, I would dream of in an indigenous led biodiversity conservation plan. Thanks. Yeah, I guess uh, from my perspective, I, I would add, uh, I would only echo that, but I would add that uh, the work that we've undertaken both at the Quinault Nation and, the, and at the National Congress, uh, our policies that not only reflect our, our values on how people should behave, but among bad actors, what should be done. Uh, right now, there are multinational corporations that are uh, being supported politically. They're being allowed to continue to exploit our lands, pollute our air without consequence every single day. And they must be held accountable and they must pay the price 
for the massive damage that they've caused, not only uh, recklessly, but knowingly. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of information that we're starting to uncover about some of the fossil fuel companies that knew back in the 70s and 80s, and they had board meetings. They knew uh, that carbon emissions and some of their activities were going to cause the, the destruction and the damage that we see. And they still put their profits above at, you know, at the expense of everyone. And, and so at the Quinault Nation a few years ago, we made an effort to price carbon and the fossil fuel industry spent $33 million, the Western States Petroleum Association, to kill our citizen initiative. We were frustrated. We couldn't get legislation in Olympia, a state like Washington, where our governor ran on a presidential campaign for climate policy. And we, could, we certainly can't get climate policy in, in DC and so we thought, let's take it to the citizens. The citizens of the state of Washington will know and understand that. And the reason I say that's so important from a, a policy perspective, when you look at the scale of, of not only the pandemic, you look at the scale of the climate impacts, do we have dollars in the public treasury that even come close to meeting that need for restoration, for restoring um, our rivers, for restoring those uh, species that are on the brink of extinction forever that can never, no amount of money can bring them back. And people just need to have that sense of urgency. We no longer have time uh, day by day, month by month. Uh, we, we thought 10 years ago, the impacts of climate change are going, only going to increase in intensity and frequency. And look what's happening. We knew a decade ago, the impacts of climate change is gonna lead to global pandemics. And now we barely have public resources to contend with a pandemic, let alone uh, all of these other impacts, whether they're wildfires in, in California, where there's no longer an off season, we're seeing mega fires, not just 100,000 acres, millions of acres. We're seeing, you know, the, the impacts on the coast of the, the, the Gulf, um, the Gulf Coast in hurricanes and tornadoes. And I, I'm just concerned that we're going to get to that place where the public resources are just simply not going to be there. So we have to be aggressive and holding those who are directly responsible accountable to pay the price for the generations of damage that they've caused. First and foremost, to me, that's, uh, that's one of the first things that should be part of an indigenous led. And, and I'm finding we're having allies inside and outside of Indian country, people that know that to be true, but they're wondering why their elected officials are approaching this public policy with a political calculus and not advocating what they think is minimally necessary. So. From my perspective, that's the one part is garnering the resources we need to do the work that's minimally necessary. And then I, I, I couldn't agree more with Norma, uh, the international uh, policies. Uh, in the state of Washington, when we did 1631, we included FPIC, free prior and informed consent in that legislation. The following year, our attorney general uh, passed an administrative policy in the state of Washington implementing FPIC. And it's a basic principle that no country, no other sovereign nation should unilaterally take um, uh, actions against a, an indigenous nation, our territories and resources without our consent. And so we need to work at the top level. We need to work at every level to, to make those advancements. And, and I often thought we need to, to rise and achieve political equality uh, with the United States. And I've come to learn, no, we are up here with a global community that understands these principles the United States is here and they need to come up to our level to implement those basic principles that the rest of the world recognize is minimally necessary to protect the rights of indigenous peoples and to protect our, um, our, our natural world. So from my perspective, those are the two things I, I, I would advocate. We, we need an aggressive agenda that holds those who are directly responsible and we need to continue to advocate and advance those foundational principles that will protect our, our land territory from unilateral action without our consent to continue to exploit our lands. The question is what might an indigenous led biodiversity action plan look like? And I totally agree with, with the, the sisters before me that, you know, the indigenous and community led processes um, will always from our hearts work to fruition to and get bigger and bigger as long as people work with us and join us right uh, the, it, they would represent a long-term commitment to conservation it would elevate our rights and responsibilities in partnership um, we always hope for that all our lives we fought for that 
it, these will create opportun opportunities to reconnect to the land, to heal, to heal, to heal our territories. And we have to we have to start from the center and work out. And then each community, uh, indigenous peoples who are all over the world, to assist them in moving from the center, working out to take care of their peoples, their water especially as well. Um, create this will create opportunities for economies. Uh, it will help us help others. Um, so, and provide opportunities for actual true reconciliation. That needs to be where um, governments at all levels need to work with us as indigenous peoples through true reconciliation as well. I just wanted to add that. Thank you so much, Norma, Fawn, and Robin. Um, I feel like I still have more questions, but um, we need to give everyone else time to ask their questions. Um, so we'll transition right now. Uh, we'll also have a video from the Indigenous Design and Planning Institute, which is one of the partners organizing this, um, this webinar this evening. And, um, and then we'll move into Q&A from folks in the audience. Welcome. My name is Ted Hohola, and I'm the director of the Indigenous Design and Planning Institute. And our institute was created in 2012 in order to see how culture and identity can help inform community development. So our goal really is to immerse our degree plan in work that assists tribes by involving students, by involving professionals, by involving faculty in problem solving, and in particular, looking at how it is that we can help to inform the kind of placemaking that's going on in our native communities. So we have programs that we've evolved and developed here in the Southwest regionally, but we've also expanded to other areas, including Mexico and Ecuador. So we hope that you would be interested in some of the activities that we have and that we can really have you think about joining us in our program. Thank you for looking at our website. Thanks for sharing those videos. It's nice to get a chance to hear from each of those people. Um, I have several questions here from the audience um, and some of them are multi-part questions. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'll read a few questions and then um, Maybe you all can kind of jump in as, and respond to the parts that you feel uh, most interested in responding to. Um, so one of these multi-part questions is, can the panelists talk a bit more about interspecies kinship? What does that mean? How do notions of reciprocity and responsibility play into kinship relations? And then there's a third part, but I think I'll pause with that because that seems like three questions in a row to start with. <laughs> I guess I, I would uh, lead off with a, a quote from Chief Seattle that all things are connected. What we do to the earth, we do to ourselves. So understanding that uh, all, all things are connected and that we are just one uh, strand of a very complex weave uh, of life. So that to me is, is the most important thing to, to understand and, and realize that uh, not only do we have a relationship that it, it, it's a very sacred and honored relationship that we must uh, be respectful of, of all things living. And so uh, that's how I would answer that question. Um, I, would, I would want to jump in and actually sort of base this in language to say that, you know, kinship, I think, is a verb. We make kin, you know, we make relationship. And I think that the link that the questioner is is is, is asking is that I think it is reciprocity that makes kinship because it's that mutual responsibility. It's that notion of interdependence that's been brought, brought up so many times, but that if we want to, that we can't just think about kinship as a static thing. It's something we create, something that we invest our energy in, and we do it through mutual care for each other, this exchange of, of, of gifts between living beings and, 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 and all, I mean all living beings, right? Um, we are all in this uh, mutual flourishing. There, there was another thought I would add to that. And we, we often think about our role as um, 
you know, living a way that's balanced and, and a way of life and values, et cetera. I think there's also an element of responsibility that in, in the face of exploits of our natural world, if we choose to do nothing, knowing that there's a problem, we become complicit. And, and so I think there's a dual responsibility of uh, living a life in, in which we lead by example, we share our values, we, we embrace others, we ally with others that share those values, but we also join forces with others when there's a threat to, to any part of, of our natural world. And, and it goes to my point earlier that that's just what we do. And if, if in the face of that, we choose to do nothing, we are, are not honoring our ancestors and we're not honoring future generations yet to be born. So I just would like to add to that, um, that from uh, our perspective and the ancient knowledge, we are all related. Mm -hmm. um, we are all related and connected to our all my relations meaning all the species of mother earth and each other, all the races of peoples. Um, that's how I was taught in my language that um, right now I can say that I have relatives in New Mexico and I have relatives in Arizona. Um, I, we have, and all across the indigenous worlds, we are all connected so profoundly um, through this entire continent uh, down to South America. And uh, so we are not separate from our being, from our connectivity to, to, to our homelands. We are part of the land, part of the water. And I think to me, that is a very strong kinship, kinship to our caribou, kinship to our salmon, like this, the such sacred beings. In our way, we hold them up we hold them up above us and um, because they have sustained us. And if we don't continue to hold them up, um, the earth and those species are not going to no longer sustain us. So mm -hmm. I think it's all our responsibility to do that because yeah, we only, again, we have one planet earth and uh, we got to come together and be able to do that because it's all my relations. Um, I have another question here that is from a student. Um, this person says, I am an environmental science major at UNM and I want to help in the shift from anthropocentric views of nature within STEM. And the question is, how can non-Indigenous folks who are not in government support this work? You're gonna have to repeat that question to me because it's uh, uh, oh, yeah. maybe, maybe um, put it kind of, so I could understand it. Sure, so this, this question is from a, a, a student who's studying science and they're asking, how can non-Indigenous people um, who are also not working in government, so not policymakers, how can they support the work that, um, that you all have been talking about in this, in this webinar? I think um, one of the things that's really, really important in the area of research and science is that uh, indigenous peoples come from a very ecosystems approach. We don't just dissect or look at one thing. If we look at um, caribou, for example, we look at everything that's connected to the caribou, the food that it eats, the animals that it work with, the muskrats that bring food from the bottom of the lakes to feed the lactating cows when they're walking by on those lakes to, to have go to their birthing grounds. I think there's, we take a very ecosystems approach to how we look at our world and not just look at it in one way. So if we're researching something, um, you're, you're asked to research something out there, uh, go research, um, I don't know, uh, squirrels or, or um, um, a plant. Then from our perspective, we look at that everything in relationship to that plant. And, uh, and it becomes a whole ecosystems. So I, I, I hope I said some light from our perspectives on that question. I would also add to that, something that I shared with, with my own students who 
who are troubled by this as well. They want to use the tools of science, but are discouraged by this really anthropocentric view that takes everything apart, that redu reduces it to little bits. Um, and what I tell them is that Western science is a set of tools. You know, in your environmental science program, you're learning a set of tools. You don't have to accept the worldview in which those tools are embedded. The worldview of reductionism, the worldview that the world is just stuff for us to take, um, that the world is not inspirited, that, that, that plants and animals don't have their own intelligences. Those aren't scientific tools, that's the scientific worldview. You can use the powerful tools of Western science in a framework of the indigenous worldview that's based on justice and the sacred nature of, of the land and, and reciprocity um, and responsibility and reverence. So I, I would urge you to be really discerning and say, these are the tools that I am learning, but I can guide them by my own values and, and love for the earth. And I, I would add that um, uh, I, I, I agree with all, all the points that were made and, and trying to think of what I could add to that conversation. Um, I, I guess the, the one bit of advice I would have is that uh, there's a desire that's put on your heart to want to um, serve in this way and to be part of this solution. And I, I would just uh, know, acknowledge and recognize that this is sacred work and that you do have a purpose and you do have a calling and, and there is a desire on your heart and, and just know that all the answers aren't going to come to you right away. And, and often I, I step back and realize that the opportunities that are in front of us are unmanageable and you can't imagine the good things that are going to happen, the good relationships that are going to come about. And just, just have faith in that process and, and know that if you live a balanced life and you're honoring the work and those around you, you're going to be guided and led to, to that place where you're going to make a contribution. So I, I would just follow that close um, thing in your heart that's guiding you and, and just trust that it's going to take you to places that you can even imagine. You're going to cross paths with some extraordinary people that are involved in this work and just embrace every moment and every opportunity. And you're gonna find throughout your professional career, you're gonna grow, you're gonna learn, you're gonna share, and you're gonna be ultimately part of the solution. Thanks. Um, and here's another question um, that I, I think probably a lot of people in the audience are have this question as well. Um, and the question is, what conservation efforts are having a positive impact in your community? So each of your individual communities, and how can tonight's audience support these efforts? I think maybe I'll, I'd be happy to start off because what's really on my mind is in, in the um, communities around me um, and, and both here in Onondaga territory as well as back in Oklahoma and around everybody's territory are food sovereignty um, movements. And you know, in maybe in the Western world, we don't think about food sovereignty and biodiversity in the same breath, but they're so closely related because the food sovereignty movement of decolonizing our diet, of, of, of cherishing the seeds and all of the varieties, growing in polyculture, creating regenerative agriculture so that there are um, abundance of places for pollinators, not poisoned sterile fields from Monsanto. Um, the food sovereignty movement is a powerful way to support uh, local biodiversity. Um, and again, it, it just reinforces this this notion of mutual flourishing, that when the land is healthy and all of our relatives on the land are healthy, then we'll be healthy too. And that there should be no separation between those things. I just um, want to tell a little story about my community. There's 250 people there and it's a fly-in community, Arctic community. Um, uh, everything is flown in fuel, diesel, uh, food, um, 
it's a really good thing that we still have an abundance of animals and because of climatic changes, a lot of other terrestrial animals are beginning to move north, uh, which we're going to have to eventually share. But my community, the young people got together and started looking at the, the cost of flying in uh, thousands of gallons of diesel fuel every couple of months by air and looked at that and they created a solar system. Oh. Um, the young leaders took, oh, took this over and uh, um, created a huge um, uh, um, area at the end of the airport with all these solar systems. And, and now they're looking at wind energy. And uh, these are my younger people. Like I, I'm just so proud of them. And uh, they're looking at that and working towards that. And, um, and it's now starting to work. They're now in, at a place where power is being sold back to the, to the, the powers that be. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah. And then we go on a uh, Yukon level and our leaders, our, our indigenous leaders are looking very serious about taking care of those lands and homelands within our tr tribal territories, our traditional territories. And they're monitoring the, the changes. They're monitoring the animals to see if they're okay. They're, they're educating youth. And also like, we still have a lot of work to do, but on the, in like the national level, um, the government of Canada is beginning to open its doors more to indigenous peoples to collaborate in the area of climate change and adaptation um, and also creating indigenous protected areas and conserved areas um, and more lands being conserved. And we still have a long ways to go with food insecurity though. We have, we are of course in the Arctic regions top of um, food insecurity. And um, some of our communities have gone ahead and done research as to what kinds of foods can be grown within their specific areas. So I'm really proud to say in the Yukon territory, there's huge community gardens where they're beginning to sell us food um, and also husbandry. They're looking at that also. And they, they're becoming self-sufficient in that way. We did the big research and we asked, what's going to replace your caribou and your salmon? And they thought about it. We weren't, we weren't farmers. We, you know, were Arctic peoples. And a lot of people, you know, decided in those particular communities that they were going to move ahead with a community garden, like big gardens that uh, feeds the entire community. So those are the kinds of things that our communities are doing. And, um, yeah, it's, it's moving slowly, but surely. And I think it's going to get better. I think we have to, you know, put the shovel to the soil, grow some food, get some green energy in our communities and get off the grid. I, I would add to that. Um, I think that is a, a way of combining our traditional knowledge and new and emerging science and best practices. Um, you can take that body of knowledge and that brain trust that we all hold within indigenous nations and, and, and together with new and emerging uh, science and some of the things that uh, the best minds are putting together to solve the problem of climate change is a target rich in, environment. Uh, and that is something that we have employed uh, here at Quinault to, to restore those sockeye runs that I had talked about at the beginning of my remarks, we had millions in the 50s and 60s. A year I got elected, we only had 3,000. Uh, we constructed some engineered log, log jams, ELJs, that was new and emerging science. We partnered with private landowners who historically had been very adverse to the nation uh, with our federal partners, the county, the state. We came together to put this project in, in the aftermath of that storm that I talked about, the December 1st storm, we use the debris from that large uh, wind blowout to construct these jams uh, that, that protected some of the original spawning habitat of our prized blueback salmon. And, and those are examples of where we, we bring the best uh, of science. We bring the best of 
the brain trust and the wisdom that our tribal nations to find those solutions. And I really appreciate what Norma has said throughout her remarks in talking about the youth, because in our initiative, we made a point of entry for education. And I firmly believe that we have to find as leaders every opportunity to, uh, to engage our youth, because while we're working on these large multi-generational plans, ultimately, it's going to be a 15-year-old kid who 10 years from now is going to be an adult in a position to implement and execute the vision and wisdom. So those are some of the things that I would add to conservation efforts uh, that, that's going to be the key to our success. Thanks so much. Um, I'm looking at the time and realizing that we are at the end of our session. Um, so I just want to thank you, Robin, Fawn, and Norma. It's been a real privilege to be able to spend this time with you. Um, and I've learned a lot and I'm sure everyone who's joined us did as well. Um, so thank you again so much for taking the time to be with us and um, share your thoughts and be in conversation with each other. Um, I also wanna thank the team who made this webinar happen and um, thank everyone who joined us today uh, to listen in. Um, I'd like to invite all of you to attend the upcoming, which is the final webinar in the series that will happen on Thursday, December 3rd. And the recordings from the first two webinars are also available on the Species in Peril website. So thank you again, and I hope you all have a great night. Thank you. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Robin and Norma. I really appreciate joining you. I, I, I've learned so much. Thank you. I, I did too. I want to say thank you and thank you for voting, everybody. All yes. the Native Americans, people of color, thank you so much for voting.